Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about sampling and uh, just a, a quick view of what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk about what, what sampling is and then a bunch of different ideas on, on how to do it uh, and a few examples. Um, I do work for Honeycomb. Uh, this talk, however, is not about Honeycomb. It's about sampling. Obviously, Honeycomb does a very good job of this. The things that I'd like to talk about are applicable to every event system out there. Uh, so people talk about metrics and logging and tracing. I'd like to say metrics and logging and events and tracing. Uh, I don't really want to get into that too much. I'm happy to talk at length about it to all of you after. Sampling is a, is a critical component of getting any event system to uh, work with a high volume service. Uh, my background, I've been doing uh, ops and stuff for a decade or so and uh, have started doing more of an engineering role here and I've spent way too long working in metrics. Uh, I, I, was, I am reformed. Um, I believe that metrics have a place, but uh, where, as, where once they were the solution to everything, um, they are now, I th in, at least in, in my view, uh, getting pushed off to the side a bit. Maybe that's what uh, Richard was talking about, the revolutionary part. Um, but uh, they have a place, uh, but it's, it's not quite as central as it should be, or as, as it used to be. So sampling. Um, well, I say it's revolutionary, but really sampling has been going on for decades or hundreds of years in science. When you want to understand what the temperature is in San Francisco, what do you do? You measure five or six points, and you consider that to be the temperature of the city. You're taking a few measurements and believing that that represents the entire state of the thing that you're interested in. But in, when running services and running uh, internet systems, we have access to all the data. When you think about people sampling you know, 10 different locations in San Francisco to get the temperature, um, really, that's because they can't measure everywhere. It's impossible. But when you're looking at uh, traffic through a web server, you can look at every single event that went through. So why should we only look at some of it? In most cases, and there are a few exceptions, in most cases it doesn't make sense for your observability framework to be as large as your production framework. Uh, there are some cases, there was a fantastic talk at Monodrama last, uh, earlier this year by CERN, uh, you know, the, the research organization in Europe, and they, their observability framework is significantly larger than everything else because that's what they care about. But for LinkedIn, for Honeycomb, for all of us, uh, what generates revenue, what our users care about is not our observability framework. We should uh, try and compact the data that we have flowing through the production system in order to get an understanding of how it's, how it's flowing. So how do we reduce that data in size? Uh, Obviously, we can measure fewer things. If you uh, pay close attention, you measure more things. And if you don't pay close attention, you measure more things. So obviously, that's a, a failing strategy. Um, but uh, the most common strategy is to send aggregates. This is what metrics do. You take an enormous amount of data flowing through your system, compact it down to uh, a couple of key numbers, and report those, saying, OK, over the last 10 seconds, 30 seconds, minute, whatever, I have seen this many things, and the average and 95th percentile of their number was this. And that's very effective. It has worked for monitoring systems for decades, and uh, they continue to do so well. Um, I'm not talking about that. What I would like to see is events that represent the entire context of a single event, a single uh, interaction with a service, um, and you can't collapse that in the same way that you can individual measurements because you lose the context that is what makes it useful. So if traffic coming from a particular uh, region of the world is slower than others, if all you're measuring is the time and getting a distribution across that time, you lose the differentiation of that section of the world from this section. So you want to keep those things together. This is what I'm talking about when I, when I refer to an event. It's a, a record of all of the interesting aspects of an interaction with a service uh, kept together so that all of those pieces remain uh, relatable. In order to measure that through your service, uh, you need to throw out many of them in order to only, uh, in order to not overwhelm your observability stack while keeping costs manageable. 
So I want to show you what I mean uh, with an example of a web server. This is obviously too small to read, um, but you can sort of guess at the shape. Uh, this is a, a web server log-ish. Um, it has uh, a timestamp. Um, uh, what else does it have? A HTTP method, a, a URL endpoint, status code, a couple of timers, and so on. If I want to sample this uh, at a rate of, say, one, one to five, um, there are 20 rows here. I should select four of them at random and say, OK, these four are going to be my representative set. These four are going to uh, contain all of the different elements that I want to look at, uh, and they're going to stay grouped, um, but I'm only going to, uh, to look at those four. Now, looking a little more closely, um, there are a couple of different uh, columns that we're interested in looking at. There's uh, the timestamp. It's unique across each one. Uh, maybe unique. Uh, this data set happens to be low enough traffic that microsecond uh, resolution is unique. There is a build ID. It's the same in every one. Uh, there's an endpoint. So in this, uh, it's, it's collapsed down to like the, the handler that's, that's uh, providing the service. So it's not actually as unique as an actual URL. Uh, HTTP method, is, there are three gets in a post. Um, there's a content length. Uh, HTTP status, three 200s and a 302. The variability of each of these columns, uh, I'm going to talk about as cardinality. So they range from low cardinality to high cardinality. The timestamp is high cardinality. It's different in every one of them. The build ID is low cardinality. It's the same in every one of them. The other columns are somewhere in between. But if you, if you collect uh, numbers on all of these, you know, three gets in a post, uh, that's more or less representative of the complete distribution. Um, three 200s and a 302, also representative. So these samples, they do effectively represent uh, these 20 requests. Now, not perfectly. It's four out of 20. Uh, as volume grows, statistics is on our side. And they will, uh, they will get closer to being uh, an accurate representation. They're selected at random. So I said one out of five but I didn't take the first one and then skip the next four, and then take the next one and then skip the next four. Uh, though in this data set, it wouldn't make a difference. Uh, that, kind of artif that kind of strict ticking can create patterns or it can hide patterns that exist in the data set. So it's important to select each one of these elements uh, using some random randomness in the system. Now, we have an advantage uh, another advantage over the, the people that are uh, actual, like actually doing science and things, um, in addition to having access to all the source data, we can impose some of our own desires on the source data uh, in a way that lets us influence which samples are interesting. Traffic flowing through our systems uh, is, is not all equally interesting. There are some activities that happen all the time. Uh, you know, your, your load balancer uh, sends out health checks to all of your backend servers all the time, and it's terribly boring. We want to know that's happening. We really care very little about it. Uh, certain types of interactions with the system. You might care more about recording uh, read writes that happen and less about recording reads or uh, errors are for us at least, who are monitoring production systems, always more interesting than successful traffic. We think about a lot of the monitoring systems that, that we use and the observability systems as being operationally focused. But many of the questions are surprisingly similar to the questions that the business side of the house is asking about our traffic, whereas we are asking about what's the percentage of successful traffic. Uh, the business might be asking what's the percentage of uh, people that actually buy things compared to just wandering around the site. A lot of that data is available, and uh, we, we should pay attention to that as we are uh, making sure that we're, we're collecting data that's useful to all of the customers within, um, within our company. So in order to understand what the relationship is between these different uh, types of traffic, I want to suggest we create keys. Sam keys that will influence the sample rates we choose for different types of traffic. Now, a, s a very simple example is to think about HTTP status codes. Uh, you can say, you know, 
Traffic in the 200 range is successful. I care less about that. Traffic in the 500 range is very important. That was a server error. I care very much about that. 400 range, eh, not so sure, and so on. Uh, so you can use that to influence the sample rate that you are applying to your data in order to select the most interesting traffic and still keep the total volume tamped down. Status code is an interesting one uh, because it's easy. You can enumerate the list of, of uh, conditions, but there are all sorts of other aspects of your traffic that might be useful to use to influence the sample rate. Uh, whether it's operational, uh, maybe there's an, an error flag that is sometimes set. Uh, that's a very strong signal. Maybe there's a customer ID and you want to make sure to collect some information about everybody while not overwhelming the system with uh, your higher volume customers. For tracing, uh, the request ID comes in very handy. So I'm going to talk about keys a bunch uh, in the next half of the talk, uh, and that's what I mean. Create, taking a selection of the content of each event that's coming through your system and using those in order to influence the sampling choices you make. I mentioned uh, sampling uh, one out of every five events. I could have said sample 20%. Sampling's main goal is to reduce the amount of traffic flowing from your production systems to your observability systems, and you want to reduce that by at least an order of magnitude, maybe two or three. Using percentages is just inconvenient. You've thrown out 90% of the, the usable number range. You know, I'm not talking about 63% or 85%. I'm talking about 10% or 5% or 1 or 0.1 or 0.01 or 0.001. I don't want to be saying 0 0.00003. One out of 20,000 is a lot easier. So ratios. Um, we talked about choosing representative elements randomly. Um, here's the last catch. If you are going to be sampling traffic when you collect it, you have to communicate this to the system that's going to be visualizing it. So you could have a configuration. Say, I'm going to sample one out of every five. Your visualization system, when it shows you a count of all of your traffic, multiplies what it knows by five. Everything's well and good. Uh, that only works in the simplest case when you have a fixed sample rate. Uh, as soon as you start getting more interesting, you need to communicate your sample rate along with the payload of the event you're, you're reporting as part of the metadata so that the visualization engine can use that sample rate to influence all of the math that it does to create the graphs that you're going to be uh, looking at. Not just counts, um, averages. Well, averages are, are relatively easy. Um, percentiles get more interesting. Uh, it distributions and histograms. Uh, you, you have to have that as a native part of your data package in order to make any of that possible. So uh, that's sort of a, the, the quickest overview of sampling in general that, that I, can, I can give you. Um, I hope all of it makes sense. Uh, what I want to do now is just talk about, well, uh, a number of different methods you could use to sample your traffic. Uh, these are selected from two libraries, and they're available for you. Uh, one is one that we wrote. It's called Din Sampler. It's in Go. Another is the Jaeger Tracing Client Library, uh, also in Go. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm sure Jaeger has other client libraries as well. I hope their sampling implementations are consistent. Uh, but we only have one in Go for you. Um, there are many more methods you could use than, than the ones listed here. Uh, I selected these in, in hopes of Oh, starting the conversation, and from there, uh, making, making, uh, making it easy for everyone else to ask interesting questions. So uh, everything's set. Let's just jump in. Constant rate we talked about already. This is a simple case. One, out, one event out of n, uh, one out of two, 50%, one out of 10, 10%. Um, this works really well when you have uh, a system that doesn't have a lot of differentiating characteristics to its traffic. If you're recording, say, NetFlow from a switch, uh, there's not a lot of extra data there that you might want to influence a sample. So don't. It's simple. It works. Uh, it's very scalable. It's very easy to configure. It's very fast. 
the main complaint is that if you have infrequent traffic, if somebody hits an error only once, uh, you are highly likely to miss it. And that's sort of okay. Uh, because, again, statistics are in your favor. When, you, when you're sampling at a high rate, you also have a high volume, and things that happen once are bound to happen again. So, for the most part, okay. The consistent sample is an interesting one, uh, because distributed tracing has a different version of the sampling problem than most systems that are, are concerned only with uh, looking at, at services one at a time. If you are building a trace that comes in the front door and goes to this system and back and then goes to a couple others and hits a database and goes and does a couple of other calls and so on, uh, you are interested in catching that entire trace. So if each system is uh, collecting information about its own operation and shoving that into a span and then reporting that on to your, your tracing system, they need to be coordinated about when they're going to choose to sample in order to get the entire trace, or uh, all of the spans in a trace, or none at all. It gets a little uh, complicated if you want to get too fancy, um, but the one piece of data that is easy to plumb through and is required for a tracing system to work is the trace ID, and given a correct method of generating the trace ID in a random spectrum, you can do fixed math uh, a, a less than comparison on that trace ID given a probability um, in order to uh, make the same choice across many different servers. It's still relatively simple. Uh, it's especially effective for tracing. Uh, doesn't fit enormously well with many of the other uh, methods we're talking about, but it can be combined if if you pay attention to some subtleties. Uh, Mac of rates we covered already. This is um, the idea of taking a, a small set of values, like HTTP status codes, and saying, I want to sample 200s at uh, a rate of 1 to 1,000. And I want to sample 500s, not at all, and 300s and 400s, maybe 1 to 100. You can enumerate this clearly in a configuration. This is, uh, it, it's effective for HTTP status codes because it's low cardinality. You can enumerate them. Uh, it's especially useful in uh, log transmission pipelines for which the configuration is either a DSL or uh, a small amount of, of code, but not a, f a full language. Things like Logstash, uh, it's relatively easy to test the HTTP status code against a, a, a set of values and if then, um, if then else clause and set a sample rate. Uh, so this will stick around uh, predominantly because there are many systems like that that you want to uh, downsample your traffic a little bit, but you don't have full access to uh, a compiled fast engine to, to make sophisticated choices. It does require maintenance by hand, so um, that's, that's tough. Rate limited, uh, I, I came up with a, a terrible analogy for the rate limited sampling algorithm earlier today, and I'm, I'm going to force you through it. Um, our, uh, our representative government system is an example of a rate-limited sampling method compared to a uh, constant rate sampling method. The House of Representatives is a constant rate sample. F population is directly correlated to the number of representatives. The Senate is rate-limited. You get two, and then you've, you've covered that state. You're done. So you're not going to collect any more representatives. Uh, the idea of rate-limiting is that you care about whether something happens, but maybe less so about how many times it's happened, usually in a given time period. Uh, things like um, exception tracking. You, know, you want to know when an exception fires, maybe once every hour or once every build or something like that, but if it's something that's firing 10,000 times, meh, not very much additional information. Uh, the dynamic map is my favorite. This is uh, the one that we use at Honeycomb. Uh, we sample all of our production traffic to send to a dog fooding cluster, and we've uh, built this into the, uh, the tools we provide our customers for sending us data. The idea is to build in memory, or in the service that's being observed, uh, a mapping of the frequency of a key, and then do some math on that frequency to, to uh, uh, fit it to a logarithmic curve. And essentially use, the, use that value as your sample rate. 
so that I'm uh, looking at the traffic that's going through the system. And instead of enumerating, you know, I want to send this many 200s, this many 500s, I'm going to just keep count of how many are coming through, and based on that distribution, choose a sample rate. And that's, it's dynamic, it, it, it's continually updating, so that uh, when the traffic changes, the sample rate adjusts to that change. Uh, I'll get back to uh, how we use it at Honeycomb in, in the examples section. Um, but it's, uh, it's incredibly flexible, and it does an, in, an amazing job of giving you visibility into the corners of your traffic in a way that is otherwise simply impossible. Uh, but it is more complex to maintain in code. Uh, remote source is one that uh, I pulled from the, the Jaeger client library, and it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, because you're choosing to delegate the choice about how to sample traffic to a uh, third-party service. Basically, it's a webhook. So for each event that comes through, you're going to call out and say, hey, you know, here's some details. Um, how should I sample this thing? Uh, which is awesome if you want to adjust your sample rate at runtime. And that's not uncommon. Uh, it's, you, you'll s understand you have some significant event coming up and say, hey, you know, I want to suddenly tweak this and really drop my sample rate so I get higher fidelity data across this deploy because I'm really nervous about this one service. And then after that's happened and then, uh, you know, I'm comfortable again, I can, I can tamp it back down. Um, using a remote source for your sample rate allows this, this kind of interactive adjustment uh, w with people in addition to the code. Um, but it's, a, it's an off-service call. It's a third-party call. That's always going to be slower than, than doing math in, in line with the code of your, of your service. Uh, and lastly, you, you can put them together. Uh, you can take uh, a couple of different algorithms and choose to use one or the other depending on the, the situation you're currently in. Uh, one that, that uh, we have in our library is uh, m merging um, a, the dynamic throughput uh, algorithm with the rate-limited one so that uh, essentially there's a, there's a cutoff. You know, we'll fit this logarithmic curve on your traffic until you hit under 10 events per second, and then we'll just always send them through because the, it's, it's getting a low enough traffic that I don't really care how, how many different keys there are. Uh, just go ahead and send it. it it's fine. Um, the Jaeger client library had a couple of these as well, uh, and it made some different decisions about the types of data it would pull from the sampling library depending on the frequency of that particular key, uh, which is really neat. Um, the downside is that it opens up all sorts of little hidden corners when these two algorithms interact with each other in a way that you didn't expect or your traffic looks a little different from what you thought. Um, so a little more fiddly, but, uh, but, but really powerful. Um, and of course, like I said, there, this is only a selection. Um, there are more in both our library and the, the Jaeger client library. Um, I put the GitHub URLs on there. Um, there are plenty more ideas. So uh, please, think about it. Um, write some. Uh, it's, it's a really fun problem to tackle. And a number of them are going to be very specific to your traffic shape, and that's fine. Uh, that's the whole idea, is that you can choose how to influence your sampling method based on your traffic in order to get relevant data out. I want to show off a few examples. Um, Honeytail is uh, a daemon that we wrote that uh, reads log files and um, uh, sends, them, sends that data into Honeycomb. Uh, it uses the dynamic map sampling. You pass it the keys you want to use. So uh, assuming, uh, let's uh, take for example, uh, you're, you're con reading an Nginx log. You could ask it to use the HTTP status code and um, the uh, user agent field as your key. Uh, you know, if you're, uh, let's say you're, you're writing something and you have you know, a, a limited set of different types of traffic coming in and you want to you wanna understand when an and Android customer is doing something differently from an iOS customer, uh, you can allow it, allow it to uh, influence the sample rate. Um, because it's a shift binary, it's a little bit less flexible than writing it in code, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good example of how to use our dynamic sampling library. Um, the Jaeger client library I talked about, uh, it, it uses primarily the con consistent sampler, though they're, they're really pushing, uh, at least there's a GitHub issue, talking about um, doing a lot more flexible sampling based on different attributes of the traffic. Uh, and the 
uh, the code contains the ability to do some of that, and it's, it's only sort of implemented in a few use cases. Uh, so I'm very excited to see uh, where, where that goes. Um, I have two pretty pictures showing uh, this kind of dynamic, um, dynamic rate limit choice. So uh, the top graph here, uh, there are three bands of traffic. Uh, one, one high and two low, and the one of the lower ones has all these little spikes coming in. Um, now this is traffic I pulled from our dog fooding system, so it's uh, representing uh, traffic that somebody is sending us, and we are sampling as we're sending it into our dog fooding cluster and recording that sample rate. And what you can see is the, the high volume, these three graphs represent the, the high volume traffic, the uh, higher of the low two and the lower of the low two. Um, they span quite a range, so depending on, you know, this, this traffic is a little noisy, so uh, there are different servers handling it, choosing different sample rates. Uh, it's basically showing up over a range. I suppose I, sh I should talk about this visualization. It's a, a heat map, so it's representing a histogram on a per time slice basis. Um, the red ones are the most frequent, the yellow ones in the middle, the blue ones are the below. So you can sort of picture a curve uh, hump in the middle uh, for each of those. The lower traffic, uh, lower volume traffic is sampled at a lower rate, um, still a, a distribution. The lowest volume, because of those, those little drop spikes, it's introducing some noise into the algorithm that's, that's choosing the sample rate. So this one, even though it's lower, shows a, a larger um, variation in the sample rates that it's choosing. Uh, so this is uh, a, youth, a, a case where the traffic is relatively consistent, but it's, there are different types, uh, so they're getting sampled at different rates. Uh, here we have one stream of traffic, um, but it's changing dramatically in volume, and the sample rate is changing accordingly, so that as the volume of data coming into the system is increasing, the sample rate is also increasing, uh, helping to make sure that the, the observability system stays comfortable. Um, in general, when thinking about dynamic sampling, if your traffic pattern can be broken down by an attribute in a way that generates a logarithmic distribution of values, you're in good shape for, distributed for dynamic sampling. These, this type of traffic will give you the best bang for your buck. Right? It will suppress the highest values effectively while still highlighting the big mess of, of low values down there. Even if uh, your traffic doesn't follow this shape, uh, it's worth trying out, uh, but you'll see the, the biggest variation in sample rates uh, is computed by one of these systems uh, in this type of situation. And that's, uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much for letting me bend your ear for half an hour, and I think I'm out of time.